You're about to join Jerry Parker, Marit Siebert, and Niels Kostrup-Larsen on their raw and honest journey into the world of systematic investing and learn about the most dependable and consistent yet often overlooked investment strategy. Welcome to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. Welcome or welcome back to this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series with Richard Brennan and I, Niels Kastor Larsen, where each week we take the pulse of the global markets through the lens of a rules-based investor. Now, for those of you who are regular listeners, our conversations are intended to give you as much of the nurture and encouragement as the turtles got back in the 1980s, as Jerry likes to put it. And if you're new to the show, we hope that today's episode will trigger your appetite to learn more by diving into the back catalog and listen to all of the past episodes that you may have missed, like last week's episode with Mark, where we explored how model anxiety shows investors to be naturally wary of rules-based systems. So if you missed that one, I invite you to go back and check it out. But not now, of course, because we have a really great episode for you this week with another trend-following friend of mine joining me today. So Rich, great to have you on this week. How are you doing? How are things down in Australia? A bit chilly, Niels, but it's great to be on board and it's a real privilege being on here with you. So uh, very happy. That's kind of you to say. Now, as mentioned, we got a great lineup uh, of questions as well. One from Crucio and one from a couple of from Danny, as well as some perhaps controversial topics about trend following. But before we dive into all of those, let me run through my brief market wrap. And of course, as I've done in the last few weeks. Before I do that, I just want to again acknowledge and give a shout out to those of you who left the rating and review this week. We so appreciate this. Of course, we would love to receive lots more rating and reviews because it is the best way for you to help the podcast grow. In addition, of course, to sharing the episodes with your friends and your network. So I truly hope that you will take the time and help us out on this uh, topic. Now, it's kind of interesting that as the world watched the opening of the Olympic Games yesterday, where there always seems to be a focus on detecting and stopping doping and other stimulating efforts from happening, you read the news about how central banks are just doubling down on their commitments to keep rates low or negative and continue to stimulate the economies by buying massive amounts of bonds. And I could not help thinking, what's the difference between doping in sports and in that world and how central banks are doping the markets? And the only difference I could think of was that in sports, it's legal, uh, it's illegal, I should say, and in public finance, it's encouraged. Anyway, the week started with sheer panic in the capital markets based on concern that the Delta strain of the COVID-19 virus was going to prompt U.S. politicians to again recommend mask wearing and stay-at-home policies. On Tuesday morning, a Goldman Sachs analysis recommended that investors not buy the dip this time. That was absolutely the wrong call because that panic had all but seen been forgotten by Friday as the S&P punched into new record territory. The bond market took its cue from stocks and gave back all of its gains for the week, closing at 1.93% yield on 30-year bonds, but still below the 2% psychological threshold. Adding to the uncertainty, the Wall Street Journal carried a front-page headline, quote-unquote, Fed ramps up debate over taper timing on Friday morning. It seems like Powell, who only a few short months ago was pledging patience, has gotten a bit rattled by the surge in inflation that he recently described as transitory. The pressure to act is likely to intensify this week with the initial look at Q2 GDP data in the US and the corresponding price index, both of which are expected to rise above uh, the first quarter levels. Let me just uh, bring you in, Rich, here, just to touch on some of the kind of bigger things that might have caught your attention, either in the market or in general, before we dig into sort of the more trend-following systems on my side. Yes, Neil. So it has been a very interesting week. I was referring on Twitter to my battleship, which is my portfolio I refer to. This sort of had to do a slight change of course as it takes a long time to turn around my portfolio. So my battleship did take a few manoeuvres during the week and 
got dented from um, quite a lot of flak coming in from left, right and centre. But as my ship straightened up and took a new course, I was lucky to at least receive some benefit from some of the commodities like coffee. And fortunately, my equities, which which were in my portfolio, whilst some of them uh, lost some of their short-term components, the rest sort of floated through quite nicely. So the ship's still intact and we're still afloat. All good as long as there's no torpedoes uh, on the radar. (laughs) So we should be fine for another day in the market. Now, in terms of an update from our side, I mean, the global sell-off that took place on Monday, it was pretty broad-based and actually it hit all but four of the markets that we have in the WMA portfolio. But clearly the massive sell-off in energies that we saw That's where most of the losses came from on that day. But, you know, markets can sometimes experience these one-day events and the rest of the week markets seem to be finding their footing and returning to their current longer-term trends. So for the week, the losses that occurred in energies and Asian equities, grains, volatility and some fixed income markets were largely offset by gains in European and U.S. equities. Coffee, as you mentioned, that actually went up 18% for the week. Sugar, copper, lean hogs did pretty well. So the week actually finished off with just a small loss in the end. Interestingly also, I noticed that my trend barometer picked up on Friday from a week level of 36, closing on Thursday, to finishing the week at 50, which is, I would say, a positive reading. Now, in terms of volatility, it was a pretty hairy week, I have to admit. The developments during the week, and in particular Monday, Tuesday, were close to kind of a perfect storm for our volatility strategy, and it resulted into one of the worst weekly results for the strategy since in its, its inception. The developments early on Monday led to aggressive buying of volatility exposure around midday Monday. Given the sharp rebound later during that day, the strategy got a bit whipsawed, losing during the initial decline of the S&P and then during the rebound due to the fact that it had switched positions on both Monday and Tuesday. Then Thursday and Friday were also rather unusual days and that the VIX as the S&P 500 was up. Both of them, the shorter dated VIX futures were up too on Thursday and only slightly down on Friday and the longer dated VIX futures were down. The strategy uh, had entered the week with a slightly above average exposure, finishing the week with almost the same exposure, um, but there had been quite a lot of trading in between. So all in all, it had a down week, about 5 6%, 6%, I think, so not a great week for the world of volatility. Now, in terms of the top traders and following portfolio, where I can go into more detail, of course, it was a down week and it leaves it down 1.78% for the month. So not a big down week, I would say. And it's still up 11.33% year to date. Performance so far for the month breaks down as follows. Group 1 models, they are down 1.78% and group 2 models are down 0.7%. And Group 3 models, the fast-reacting models, are up about 0.78%. So all three model groups lost a little bit of money during the week. In terms of sector contribution this month, the top three, well, it's really two sectors only. It's the bonds and base metals, just like last week. They're the ones making profits this month. And then the worst sectors are really equities, energies, and short-term interest rates. As we dive into the single markets uh, month to date, German Bunds and NASDAQ and US 10-year notes, they make up the top three markets. And then at the bottom of so far this month, we have the DAX, the Australian SPY, and like crude. And in terms of trading this week, really most of the action happened on Monday with this broad base sell-off. And that led to 19 trades on the days, which is for the day, which is quite a lot actually for this particular strategy. And uh, where the strategy got out of a lot of DAX positions, uh, because all the models uh, groups, they have uh, DAX in their, in those groups. So a lot of those got stopped out, as well as energy positions. This continued into Tuesday, where we got the Australian markets reacting to it. So we got stopped out of that as well. On Wednesday and Thursday, the program bought a little bit of coffee as coffee started to surge. And then on Friday, it had to re-enter the long SPY uh, or some of the long SPY positions and long SMI. In terms of the uh, riskiness of the portfolio, the risk to stop that I like to uh, quote. So if all positions got stopped out on Monday, 
it should lose about 7.45%, which is down a little bit from 7.93% the last week or so. But again, the portfolio is pretty concentrated at the moment, not a lot of positions on. We're in this neutral range in many markets, and therefore, um, of course, risk levels overall are, are, are smaller because there are simply fewer positions. With that said, let's dive into a couple of questions, and then we go on to these controversial topics, or so they may seem. The first question, Rich, that we need to uh, deal with here is from Kushro, and Kushro writes, Hi, Nils, I've been following you for a few months now and love the show. Keep it coming. Testing rules is something that is clearly coming out of listening uh, to the show. But is there user-friendly software out there that can help the novice rules-based investor? Now, I think you do a lot of testing in uh, on your side of, of the world, so to speak, Rich. Are there any software that you've come across that seem better than other when you're starting out in this world? Well, there's certainly some good third-party software that we get our teeth into over here. We have our in-house programs, which are developed by Fred, our programmer, but this third-party software, which allows people with no programming experience to develop trend-following models. So you can do that through a lot of software such as um, Strategy Quant X. That's an excellent piece of software. It's a bit like when you come first come to an Excel spreadsheet, you might only use one-tenth of it. So when you come into Strategy Quant, there's a big learning curve and you might only find that you need to use one-tenth of it because a lot of it relates to data mining, which we try to avoid. But the concepts in there in allowing you to develop your own algorithms, compile them into portfolios, those tools are all provided within that particular software. And then there are other notable software like Adapt Trade is another good third party piece of software that does a very similar thing. So, but you know, you've, you've got to shell out a bit of uh, money for these things, but, and I, I certainly don't endorse any of them, but we certainly do use some of them. Yeah. Speaking of Excel, I probably still only use about 10% of Excel, <laughs> Rich, I have to admit. Anyways, I've come across, and I don't use it myself, but I have come across the one called Blocks and how much sophistication you need to have in order to use it. I don't know personally, but I have certainly come across that name. And I'm, I'm sure there are a, f a few other ones, but at least hopefully, Kushro, there are some suggestions for you to dig into and, and test them out. Hopefully you can get a free trial before deciding what to do. The next two questions comes from Danny. Danny writes, love your show. I never miss an episode. And I find myself going back in the archives to find some other gems you guys have produced over the years. So I appreciate that, Danny. Two quick questions. Number one, I hear a lot of talk about trading multiple time frames, and I can't quite figure out what you mean. Can you give a real time example of how that would work? Are there periods where you would be long? of lumber as an example in one time frame yet short lumber in another time frame let's start with that one rich do you want to dive into that yes yeah, so we also get confused by the notion of time frame because it it depends on how that price data is constructed and as we all know price data comes to an exchange and uh, we take some graphical representation of that data in some form time-based charting methodology or whatever so we like to think of time frame in relation to trend following as look back. So when we, uh, for instance, have our breakout models, we might commence our breakout models from a 100-day look back, and then our models would then extend right out to maybe even a 1,000 or more days look back to give us variation in, in time frame extent, but still using the same daily time frame as our daily indicator, effectively. So... We, we might have a 200 look back, a, a, a 300 look back, a 500 look back, a 700 look back, and a 1,000 look back, all different variations of a similar trend following system. Yeah, and, and maybe just to expand a little bit on, on that as well. I mean, I think the easiest way to think about this, Danny, is, of course, as Rich was saying, if you use a, a very simple model, but very effective model, which is just a price channel, and you can do that as like a Donchian price channel, uh, and you can type in on a chart and say, okay, I want to see uh, the channel for 100-day highs and lows, and it'll 
draft it for you or show it on, on, on your chart. And then you do the same maybe with 50 days. And you can see that if you were following that system that, for example, you mentioned lumber. So typically what should happen is really that your 50-day high, or in this case high, would trigger the trade initially. And then later on, it's going to break up the 100-day and you're going to get the, your second buy signal. But depending on your exit and your reversal rule, you can absolutely have an example where in one time frame you're long and in another time frame you're short. It's not common, but it can happen. And that's perfectly fine. It's kind of... Is your it's the way your system or your approach makes the transition from say being fully long to fully short. That's gonna in between have some opposite uh, signals. Yet it all makes up your total position, kind of net position. So yeah, that can happen. The second question that Danny has is about position risk per trade. I wanted to get your take on how you handle dollar risk per position. Let's say I risk 50 basis points upon entering a trade and I size my trades that way. The trade goes my way and now the position has moved 20% in my favor. My trailing stop loss has gone up, of course, but I'm asking, but I'm risking more than 50 basis point of my unrealized losses. I've never paid attention to trying to protect unrealized losses that way, but I was curious if I should be. So, Rich, how would you best entertain this question for uh, for Danny about essentially managing your position risk? Yeah, so this is how I do it. And I know different trend followers do it differently, but I'm a big believer in only working off the realized balance as opposed to the equity position of your portfolio that might comprise a large component of unrealized equity when you're riding some of these very big profits. So, by working with realised balance, you're working with what I regard as a known. We know that that is a state of our system. When we deal with unrealised equity, these are things that we need to let run in, on the basis that we let our profits run. So those trades are yet to play out. So they're sort of unknowns at this point in time, even though they're represented as unrealised equity. So I, I tend to work with what I know in certainty. So I'll use my realised balance, which might be a level of capital. Of, let's say we took an example of, say, $100,000 of realised balance, and we've got $50,000 of unrealised equity, big floating profits. So in total equity of 150000 but our realised balance is 100000 I therefore use my realised balance as a basis to determine my percent allocation. So I, I, I risk 0.5% um, or 50 basis points per trade or less. Ideally, that's the smaller I can get, the better it is as far as I'm concerned. But let's say it's 50 basis points. Therefore, I, I can have a defined dollar risk assigned from my realised balance, which I apply to every one of my trades at that particular point in time. So that's working off the known knowns of my portfolio at that point in time. The unrealised equity is yet to play out. I leave that. I don't touch it. I'm a strong believer in not tampering with that unrealised equity. That That's you need that to float into the distance because it's unknown and it could be your outlier. You don't know this in advance, of course. So I let all of those things flow to let my profits run and I strictly manage my risk with my realised balance. That way, if my realised balance declines, my percent risk in dollar terms does decline. So I'm trading smaller as my realised balance declines, as I'm going into worse drawdowns over unfavourable regimes. And if my realised balance lifts, then my percent allocation therefore allows me to progressively increase or scale up my exposure uh, with my portfolio as time goes on. But let's just say to to kind of uh, go full circle on the question, let's just say that you do get a new signal, say you have 100,000 of... By the way, uh, Danny, you often hear Moritz and Jerry talk about closed equity and, and open trade equity, and this is exactly... Rich is just using some different words, but I think they're thinking of this very similarly, you know, focusing on mainly taking risk with equity that is closed, uh, closed profit equity. Anyways, Rich, if you get a signal, let's just say you had your 100,000 of, of closed equity you, you might have fifty thousand of open equity open profits so you get into the trade you take your five thousand dollar risk how do you manage that open risk of that position as it becomes profitable 
I mean, you don't need to be super specific if you... I yeah, mean, no. Uh, in general terms. <laughs> so when I take up my initial position, I define it in terms of average true range. So I'll take a particular average true range on my initial opening position, which will be quantified as a dollar risk based on my realised balance. That ATR for the initial stop is my initial placement of my stop. Immediately from that point going forward, I have a trailing stop which adopts a trailing technique in terms of ATR once again. My various models I've got, my different models have got different ATR-based initial stops and trailing stops. So they're configured separately. So it's not pyramiding. Each trade is individually configured. But it, it means that as I'm slowly progressing into a positive trade that ultimately turns into an outlier, I find that there are more and more of my systems clicking on with these different ATR-based trailing stops and initial stops. And as the, the trade becomes more and more profitable, the equity, the, the trailing stop is continually ratcheting up or ratcheting down in, in my short positions to protect some of those losses, but um, allowing full extent for that to go exponential without me tampering with it. Does that make sense? So my trailing stop is my means that profits to run but they are always being managed at each step of the trade from entry through to exit. It's not that I just take an initial position and then let it run and, until it exits on a signal. I'm always managing that trade with a trailing stop, but allowing for unlimited profit potential at all times. Yeah, exactly. And I think one of the things, Danny, that we talk a lot about is that because the path of each trade is unknown, so and sometimes you really do need to allow it to have a big retracement in that trend before it moves off. Jerry often talks about his example with Tesla, where I think it went up like 50 ATRs and then gave back 48 ATRs and then it went back up again, like 400 ATRs. So, I mean, obviously, essentially, he saw most of his profits, you know, disappear before it turned into an even bigger profit, a significantly bigger profit. Now, there are different ways of doing that and achieving that, you know, in terms of different stop loss rules. I have had my debate a little bit with with Jerry in terms of the fact that I use different types. So you could take a very simple example. If you have a 100-day breakout system, you could use 50 days as your stop. So if, if, if it's a 100-day high to get into the trade, you might use a 50-day low to get out. That, that would be perfectly reasonable. I do it differently because I would like to see different ways of expressing the, the stop. So it's not always just following the same path, so to speak, in terms of the stop. So I do use different stops, uh, not for all of the sub models, but for some of the sub model. But I would, but the system picks the one that is closest to that. Now, of course, and I agree with Jerry and Moritz when they have their concerns about this because they say, well, then you get fewer uh, sound in your sample size. Sure. But I feel I have enough data and trading the model that, that I'm comfortable with that. And that seems to have worked pretty well for me. So again, you, I think you can be creative in the way you design your systems. That is what makes them different. That's why we all have different performance at the end of the year, even though we following we follow the same principles to a large extent. But I don't think there's anything wrong with not uh, there's nothing wrong with trying to be a little bit creative and see if you can come up with something that is robust. But also tries from time to maybe better protect your open profits. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But we appreciate the questions, Danny. Thanks so much for that. All right, Rich, now we are going to do something, I think, which is going to be fun and I think also quite interesting in many ways because you brought up a few topics that you wanted to discuss and uh, you and I had a brief discussion about this uh, yesterday and I found it, I have to say, fascinating, something I haven't really thought about myself, so I'm sure a lot of people listening today may not have thought about it in the same way, even though when you start talking about it, you kind of think, yeah, okay, that actually maybe I should think about that uh, more carefully. So I'm not sure where you want to start, but I think you need to set the scene. You need to better give a bit of context. I will be patient and quiet, and then I will hopefully come with some intelligent questions and comments along the way. So let's frame the big picture, and you can just pick one of the topics you want. I think I know which one you want to deal with first, which I also found really Interesting. So the floor is yours. Let's dive into some of this uh, trend following 
controversy. Okay, here we go. Well, look, I, I'm often not very popular when I bring up these subjects in some of the areas I inhabit down here in Australia. I, I do attend some of these technical analysis meetings and sometimes when I suggest that they're looking at tea leaves, they don't sort of appreciate what I'm, I'm saying. But the way I view trend following, particularly in the way that we classify trend following, is that I've, I, I think it needs to be viewed quantitatively. So what I mean there is that a lot of people will have their own definition of what constitutes a trend. Some of them will say, well, according to Charles Dow, uh, a trend must have this exact lineup, higher highs, lower lows, you know, this, this particular defined visual form it must take to define what a trend is. I believe that, that all that serves to do is filter our opportunities or significantly reduce our opportunities in this trend-following space. I believe that the way that price action um, itself consolidates into a, a visual form creates a bit of an illusion for a lot of us traders who use price action as a basis to define what a trend is. Now, all I do is I say, be wary of making any causal related implications in relation to what you visually see. And that's predominantly because I think our brains like to um, define cause where what some might not exist. You know, the nature of the brain being in that it receives these signals and then as, as it is a huge prediction engine, it comes out with its best guess or its best prediction of what that, that particular pattern is saying to it and it therefore associates a causal reason for that pattern. But from the work that Fred and I have underdone, undertaken in relation to our assessment of the level of randomness in the market. That randomness is a very big deal in relation to these markets. It is a very efficient market as far as I'm concerned. And the edge that we extract or can extract from this market is actually very weak. So whilst people might say, well, if the edge is so weak, why are you a trader? And I think, well, the edge can be weak, but the way we compound that weak edge over time is what delivers these magnificent returns in the long run. So our systems are simply the means to extract that weak edge that might exist in that slightly non-efficient market. And then we use the powers of compounding to compound that, that slight edge that we might be able to extract from that market. But the key thing here is that it's the market that delivers that edge. It's not our system. Our system is the means to capture or extract that edge from the market. So, for instance, if my system is specifically configured in accordance with some pattern recognition, it's working on the basis that there is a, a definitive edge in that pattern itself. And I would say that, well, more closely look at that data, more closely look at that backtest over that pattern. And you might find that is just a random pattern and you are confusing randomness with non-randomness. And so the, the studies that Fred and I have done demonstrate how it is even over 1,000 trades, which um, is a, a lot of trades. Some people dependent on their frequency of tra trading might take many years to accomplish 1,000 trades. But even over a, a trade sample of 1,000 trades, we can see randomness creating a dominant aspect of that wealth story that might be present in that result. It isn't necessarily saying that there is some causal reason or causal expertise in association with what that trader has identified. And we can see this when we undertake these tests on randomly constructed data. We can see that we have magnificent returns. Maybe in a three-year period, we might be able to extract 300% return, but that is one, one outcome of a possible array, of a vast array of outcomes which stem to total failure to good success, like the lottery ticket. So what Fred and I decided to do was to start looking at this market data and assessing whether the visual form had any any sort of inference that we could conclude in it versus what we refer to as the underlying bias in that data. And that therefore brings us back to what we often hear in these trend following discussions in relation to what we refer to as autocorrelation. We are strong adherents to the principle that the autocorrelation or the another t name for autocorrelation is, what was that, the term? It effectively relates to the fact that 
as opposed to independent time intervals being independent. An autocorrelated series means that a preceding time interval might be um, contingent on or, or, or causal to another time interval. Those, those actual causal sort of ties that exist in the market data itself is what creates this underlying bias. But the, what I call the explicate form or the pattern or the form arising from that is it, it could be anything, any form, and we shouldn't attach any causal reference to the form. We should be looking in a quantitative way to how we detect that, that bias in that um, time series of data. So Fred and I, we used an approach developed by a, a very good statistician by the name of Tim Masters. And what he did was um, he took market data. And in this example, for instance, let's say we take the Euro USD um, currency. We take that market data. Now, that market data, we believe, we let's refer that as real market data. So that's the real market data that we trade our trend following systems on. Now let's apply a randomizer to that market data where we break the correlation in the series that exists in that real market data. We reshuffle everything. We still keep the same beginning point and the end point, but we reshuffle all of the data so that, that any bias that exists in that data or autocorrelation at various points on that, that data series is broken up. Now let's apply our trend following systems, the exact trend following systems we applied to the real market data, to that random market data, and let's see what we get. Now, every time Fred and I did this, irrespective of the market we chose, we found that trend following systems failed. Now, that therefore gives us two implications there. That says to us, our trend following systems applied to real market data is what's where our edge is being derived. That's a very good thing for us. It makes us feel comfortable that we're actually extracting this real data from the, from the market data. However, when we compare the market data of the real market data against the random market data, Fred and I, to the life of us, cannot distinguish visually between the two. Within the random data, we still see support resistance. We still see MACDs operating effectively. We still see all of the indicators that you'd use in your technical analysis uh, library. They're all working. That, to me, is suggesting that, well, if there is no causality in that market data, then you might as well be reading tea leaves. They're, they're giving you no, no reason to say that when you decide to launch a trade in that market data, if it's random market data, if it is random market data that has broken that bias in the series, no matter what you do, the outcome is going to be random. You could do well, you could do poorly. You won't know that after 500, 1,000 trades. So that's where we come to the principle, well, it's only the very long-term track record of 20 years, 30 years plus with a significant trade sample under your belt where you can definitively say, well, there's actually an edge, an enduring edge in this market data. There is an enduring edge that you won't see necessarily through the explicate form of that market data itself. Does that make sense? It does make sense. I think what the, the I think the surprise. If I was going to summarize this, I think the surprising thing what you're saying is that you can create these, you can take the same market data and you can create these random data series. They, to the visual eye, they look the same. They have quote unquote trends in them. But the thing is that a traditional trend following system, even if you use different you know time frames and lookbacks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, they are not able to capture those quote unquote random data series nearly as well, or they're not able to capture them profitably. When you talk about a real market data series, they are profitable over time. So, and this is interesting in some, in, in many ways, and I'm sure I haven't thought this through completely, but I often come across people when, and we look at uh, sometimes with our clients, we look together at you know a, mar a particular market to see just to visualize how we, as a trend following firm, are trying to capture that. And we have a couple of different trend following models that we 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 use in the program. And that just sometimes when you look at a five year or ten year data series and you just see the PNL just goes nowhere or drifts down, and you can't really explain it because. To the naked eye, it just looks like, oh, yeah, there's some trends, but there's some reversals and there's some more trends. And and you can't quite understand why that market 
produces such a different return from uh, another market. So I think what you're saying is that that it is hard to just look at things and say, oh yeah, that's a great market to trade because you really have to allow your system to apply its rules to figure out whether it works. The other thing I think you're saying, or at least, yeah, I think you're saying is that when it comes to so we, you mentioned that the edge is not in the system; it's in the da- it's in the market data. So I will I will push back a little bit and say, well, hang on. If that's the case, then trend followers should have more similar returns. Meaning, you know, if it's all happening in the market, which is of course not the case. So we all have our own individual edge in how good we are in capturing these these trends or from this market data. But I think the surprising thing is, and maybe this is actually something that is really important to understand trend following is that autocorrelation, which is something that I I know has been talked about before, maybe it hasn't been talked about for a few years, but autocorrelation is really something that is important to understand why trend following works. But it also helps us understand why we want to trade different timeframes because different market participants perhaps uh, take in the information at different times. And this is why trends occur. For us, it just looks like, oh yeah, there's a, there's an uptrend. But what it mainly is for the system is that it allows different time frames to get in, involved and get out of the market at different times. And overall, that helps us produce, produce profits. But the other thing, it, it talks a little bit about something I thought about since we spoke yesterday, and that is what it may mean is that we should be more careful about the markets we trade. Maybe there are markets where there are less quote unquote autocorrelation really by almost by definition than other markets. And I was thinking about maybe this is why some of these alternative markets where we know there are a few funds that were early into the alternative markets. Um, I often talk with Jerry and Moritz about, okay, which market should we trade? And some managers, they, they include everything. They trade like 300 plus markets. At done, we trade, you know, mid 50s only. So not a huge amount of markets. And some people like Jerry, they're probably somewhere in between. But I just wonder whether instead of having this attitude saying, oh yeah, we should sh- we should include any liquid market per se, maybe we need to be a little bit more careful about which markets we include. I don't know. Maybe there are some difference there, and I wouldn't even know how to tell the difference other than do back tests, of course, and say, oh yeah, this market is better than other market to trade. Am I, it's a little bit rambling here because I think it's a big topic. There are so many ways we can go with it, but what are your um, initial thoughts? Look, one of the things that Fred and I have discussed, and it might be a bit contentious, but this is what's jumped out at us. As you're aware, Niels, I track the performance of the trend followers. And I often ask myself the question, well, why is there such dispersion in returns over certain periods of time? And from this study that uh, I've been talking about, I'm starting to see a bit of clarity in what I feel might be the interpretation to take. And the way I see it is that the success of trend followers is, is basically dominated by whether or not they catch outliers. So... In the absence of outliers, their performance returns are highly dispersed or distributed by virtue of the fact that they're effectively trading random outcomes, which could be positive or they could be favourable. So when I mentioned before that we can have periods of up to three years where we see some random results, random equity curves, having 300% positive return, minus 300% positive return, the degree of variability outside of periods where these outliers exist is significant. So if, for instance, we're comparing classic trend following funds over these periods of where, where outliers have been fairly dormant, they haven't existed, they've been fairly quiet, low volatile times, we will get significant dispersion simply by virtue of luck. So rather than the skill of the manager, this is the luck of randomness in their equity curve playing out. And we might, a lot of people might assign some secret source to what they're doing, but we would say, well, maybe it's not. Now, when those outliers come, I find, and this is why we see it in the BTOP50, we see it in the SG Trend Index, 
When we see these outliers occur, we suddenly get this massive positive correlation across the classic trend followers where they're all doing well. And the impact of those outliers, they're of such magnitude that they dwarf the prior dispersion of returns that existed during that random period. It's such a dominant impact of those outliers that suddenly all of the funds, provided they have caught those outliers, they start actually converging as opposed to dispersal, but dispersal of returns. So as we go back maybe even over 20 years where we know there have been these significant outlier periods, we find that all of the classic trend-following funds actually tend to converge in performance over the long term. But if we measure it over a one-year or a two-year period where these outliers are absent, we get this massive dispersal of returns and people equate it to performance, where that's just the nature of the market. So I tend to feel that we tend to be too hard on trend followers during these periods where no outliers exist. It is what it is. That is the random nature of the market. And if they've done well, that's great news. If they've done poorly, it might not be because uh, they've deliberately designed it. Their systems have problems with them. It's just that that's what the dice has, has rolled you. However, if the crime of trend following to me is not catching those outliers and to catch those outliers requires to me extensive diversification across every liquid market because we're on the hunt for these outliers. Yeah, great point, Rich, and so much to kind of dissect from that. I think what you said just there, again, shows that it is, to some degree for sure, very important what markets we trade. And of course, you can say that, okay, a market portfolio of 60 markets that has exposure to all sectors will, to a large extent, capture most of those outliers in those sectors because a lot of those markets will be correlated, meaning you don't have to trade every single market on the planet to capture, quote-unquote, outliers in some of those sectors. Yet, sometimes, for sure, there will be a single market like lumber that just stands out. And if you're not trading lumber, okay, you're going to miss that, right? So, so I think to one part, it really speaks to market selection and the importance of that. And I think that you're spot on when you say also that, or at least I infer that you say that, and something I've always felt is that when people look at trend followers, sometimes they feel that, oh yeah, it's all the same because your correlation is 0.75. So you must be doing the same thing, which is not really true. And over the long term, it can look somewhat similar, especially as you say, during the periods where there are lots of strong trends. But one, one thing that it also reminded me of is one, one of the things that I like to look at when you evaluate managers, something that, that you have, I have done some work on, but, but this is different, is just the average wins, monthly wins over the average loss. And the reason I like that, I call it the offense-defense ratio, is because it tells you something about the system. It tells you, in my view, it tells you how good is your system at opening up for the risk taking when there are trends to be had, but also how well are you at playing defense during those times, as you mentioned, where there just not there just isn't any outliers to capture. So that ratio for me is quite interesting because I think that talks a lot about the system design. Even though it's obviously impacted by the markets in the portfolio, I understand that. But I also think that it, you can read more about the system than in, in many other ways. The other thing you said is, so we're in the hunt for these outliers, which is of course true. And therefore, when some people might argue that momentum as a whole hasn't worked that well recently. But I do think it's important to distinguish momentum from the process of trend following because the process of trend following actually is partly to do how well can we capture outliers. But it also goes for me to say then that, okay, well, therefore, even though we say that the edge is in the market data, actually, there is also the edge in how well each of us design our systems to capture the outliers. That cannot be done by the market. That has to be done by us as managers, right? So I think it's super fascinating just that study and work that you picked up on and that you then continued and really showed by just taking kind of a few different markets using the actual data series, 
then creating random data series based on that to see how different the same models turn out in those instances. It's fascinating. And it goes to the fact that you know, maybe markets aren't that efficient, right? I mean, in a, in a sense, as people might say, where, oh, yeah, it's so easy to do trend following, you can just apply anything. Well, maybe not. I mean, maybe not. Maybe you do need a little bit of skill to capture that autocorrelation better than just something that's too simple, so to speak. I think uh, as trend followers, we need to shy away from this, oh, it's all very simple thing, because the track record of the trend following community speaks for itself. And uh, if, for instance, we can find alternative techniques that can match that track record, then maybe we can be humble and say it's a simple technique. However, because on, in general, it's clear that we tend to outperform alternative techniques. I think for people to start calling our techniques simple is a bit of a misnomer. Yeah, no, in, in, indeed. The other thing that... I actually find, and I don't know, this was all some other, and, and maybe you don't want to, maybe you were not thinking of going there today, but one thing that I think you also pointed me in the direction of was something where, I can't remember who it was, but where they looked at just trend following slash momentum during different environments, you know, and we have, you know, we have deflation environments, we have reflationary environments, we have inflationary environments. And going back quite a long time and where it seemed pretty clear, even though we have very few kind of periods of this where we can go back and have meaningful performance data from trend following systems, it seemed pretty clear that deflationary environments were probably the worst environments for trend following or for this strategy. Whilst reflationary environments and inflationary environments have been pretty good. And what, of course, what is interesting is that the second of the two deflationary environments that this data that went back maybe 100 years or so have been analyzing, you know, could potentially be coming to an end. We know that it has been harder to capture trends in the last decade. It hasn't been impossible. I mean, managers have still made money, not as much as we saw earlier on. And but what's interesting is, of course, that that this environment, this deflationary environment may well be coming to an end, certainly when you look at the, some of the data and uh, some of the rhetoric from central banks. And therefore, we potentially could be at the beginning of quite a long period where there will be more opportunities, at least for trend followers. I don't think you we plan to go into that part. I think there are a few other things we wanted to talk about. But I just wanted to throw that out there as well, that we need to also put into the context performance within the environment that it's that it's been operating. Yes, I think what you're referring to that research, I think that was uh, presented by David Lundgren. It was very interesting, as you say. We can't really infer too much from it because there was such a small sample of inflationary environments, deflationary environments, reinflationary environments, et cetera. But what gave me heart was that on going into these inflationary environments, there, there certainly seems to be um, some extra benefit that tends to be accrued to trend-following methods as we move into those sort of regimes. But I tend to adopt trend-following more from an understanding of physical systems as opposed to the factors uh, that might be responsible for trends. So I sort of tend to pay less attention to things such as inflation things that obviously do cause trends, but to isolate or identify the level of impact created by a certain factor or others to me is a moving feast. So I step back from that and I look at more from a physical systems perspective regarding what I regard as transitionary environments to what I regard as environments approaching equilibrium. So there's a lot of information I can extract from that, from my understanding of how other physical systems behave in transition versus equilibrium. And I then look to the markets as another great complex adaptive system where you can infer through analogy how trends emerge and what aspect of the trend you need to capture by virtue of the mechanics of a complex adaptive system as opposed to the factors 
So I see trend following as this enduring mechanical feature of complex adaptive systems attributed to change. I believe that um, the greatest change is, of course, along the trajectory that that system evolves. The lesser change occurs during these periods of equilibrium where the system, that they, they, they try and restore balance to that system that's trying to change. So that's why I'm a trend follower, because I'm going for the big change. Um, I'm less concerned with the small change around the equilibrium where I believe our, our partners in crime who call themselves mean reverters, they're the ones who concentrate around that equilibrium. I think there's more change, more dollars in the outliers from transition. Big epoch change as it structurally changed the system going forward. And I see a lot more of them coming in the future as we go into the fourth turning, as you've talked about before in your podcast. I see these structural changes to the market And I see this massive transitional change occurring and the trend followers being one of the rare species of participant that is actually going to benefit from that massive change. All those that worry about prediction, we give them the small change of what lies around equilibrium or what the central banks can do to try and restore these or stop the change of the system. So the system wants to do its own thing. It it wants to change or it wants to find, it, it wants to evolve and adapt And at periods of time, the system also does equilibrate. But what the central banks have been doing is they've been force-feeding the system, trying to equilibrate it more. They want to stop this pent-up change that's building up behind the system. And they're tipping everything and the the, 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 the whole kitchen sink into the market. And uh, ultimately, that dries up. And when that occurs, we get this transition. That's what I'm looking forward to. And whilst my people might refer to that as inflationary, Well, that might be an aspect of inflation, but I'm more concerned with the nature of the system itself. And that's the mechanics of the system suddenly wanting to explode out of its false equilibrium that it's been put into. Yeah, no, I've I've almost forgotten about the fourth turning. It's been so quiet lately, but it's still brewing, I think. So, yeah, we may be certainly in for some interesting times ahead what are the other topics of the list you made, Rich, that you want to dive into before we sort of slowly start to... But by the way, I have some big announcements, I think, to make in a few minutes. So, But be- let's just continue down our trend-following path. So, into that. look, I'd like to just throw a couple of things in. It's about why we... why, How to consider a stop and how to consider a trailing stop and how to consider small bet size. And a lot of people, that there's often a question you hear in the circles about do you or do you not use stops in your trading system? And, of course, as trend followers, we always do use stops. But I'd like to suggest that it might not be for the reason that a lot of people think we use stops. So when people uh, say that they use a stop in a system, it's, it usually infers that is where at all costs, that trade will get out or exit from that system. And we know that actually is not always observed in areas of high volatility with very high slippage, such as back in, I think it was 2015, I remember being in the, that awful Swiss dollar collapse and I was on the wrong side of it and my stops didn't save me there. I incurred this massive slippage. It was about 2% slippage. I was trading uh, 0.5% or 50 basis points and I copped 2% slippage. But because my bet size was so small, that is what allowed me to survive the day. It wasn't my stop. So it's my small bet size. So that is achieved through our extensive diversification, through uh, we've got this lump of capital, we diversify as much as we can to reduce the bet size. To me, that is a risk mitigation measure. Mm -hmm. And we do it across as many different uncorrelated markets as we can. Small bets, that is our ultimate risk weapon. The initial stop to me is a way that is to be considered at the global portfolio level. It's our way that we release risk from our portfolio. It's a bit like a portfolio being a big risk sponge that just sucks in risk. Every time we add a new market, add a new system, we're adding risk into a portfolio. Now, a lot of people who don't with a lot of people that don't trade with with stops, they find that risk, risk builds up in that portfolio. There are some adverse return streams which I refer to as warehousing risk in that portfolio. The risk uh, 
is latent. It hasn't, it hasn't been released yet, but it's building and building. And that leads to catastrophic risk if it's not attended to. So the stops that we use across our portfolios is our way of releasing risk steam. The only way we can um, eliminate risk, because risk can never be destroyed, it can only be transferred, unless you exit the trade and then it's removed, the risk is removed. So we exit the trade using those stops in our portfolio to release risk from the portfolio. That makes our portfolio at all times as optimal as possible in relation to minimising warehouse risk in that portfolio. So then our portfolios, a bit like a battleship, are always configured for battle, for future risk. They're always optimised to carry more risk in the future. That's why we use this initial stop. It's not to get us out of a trade at all costs, it's to release risk from our portfolio. So the trailing stop, what is that used for? Once again, it's a bit of a naive conclusion in my mind, at least, is that that's our method of exiting our trend. It's actually our method of ensuring that we allow profits to run because we don't use a profit target. We use a trailing stop. By not using a profit target, the two aspects of our mantra, cut losses short, are dealt with our uh, small bet size and our risk releasing from our portfolio and our trailing stop is our method to allow for unlimited profit potential. When that trailing stop is hit, the system, which is defining its trend, the, how the system sees that trend, not the market trend, but how that system captures that aspect of trend, that's when the system exits uh, from the situation when that trailing stop is hit. That's uh, just a different way of looking at initial stop, trailing stop, small bet size. Yeah, super interesting very important to understand that. So I think that's great stuff. Anything else, Richard, you want to bring up now or do you want to save it for next month when you're back? Save it for a rainy day. I might run out of things to <laughs> say very quickly. Fair enough. Let's save it for a rainy day. Before I go into some of these announcements uh, that I have on my side, which I, f I hope you'll find really exciting, just a quick update on performance. Actually, from Thursday to Thursday, which is the data that uh, I talk about because obviously we don't have the Friday data yet. Not a great deal of change and you could certainly be excused for not thinking, yes, last week was an exciting week in the markets. But anyways, beats up 15 decks down only 16 basis points for the month, up 5.95% for the year. Sokjen CTN decks down 63 basis points for the month, up 5.84%. Sokjen Trend down 68 point basis points, up 6.66% for the year. And the Sokjen Short-Term Traders Index up 0.26% for the month, up 1.26% for the year. As I mentioned, the trend barometer finished at 50, which is an okay level. So hopefully there are some better wins or better trends coming up soon. MSCI World up for the month, 1.83% and 14.21% for the year. And World Government Bonds are doing well this month, up 1.28%. Now, so... Now, I've been teasing these announcements, so let me dive into this a little bit. Now, most of you know that I have been doing the podcast now for uh, more than seven years, and it's evolved over time, for sure. We've got new series and people joining the podcast and so on and so forth. And I think it's time again to take it to the to the next level, so to speak. And some of you may already have noticed the beginnings of the next chapter because when you look at the uh, podcast players that you download, hopefully you will subscribe to. Or now it's called Follow because subscription is paid for. And as you know, Top Traders Unplugged have so far been free of charge. And so when you follow the podcast, which uh, I hope you do, in your player, you'll see that there is a new color scheme. For example, there's new design of the artwork for each episode and there's a little bit of a, a change to the main artwork with some new color. So that's kind of the first way that you guys will be noticing that something is happening. The much bigger change is being worked upon and will happen to the actual website itself. There will be a brand new Top Traders Unplugged website coming on which I hope uh, you'll like with some improvements. And although there's, I'm sure there's going to be some bugs in the beginning, I think there might still be some bugs in some of the podcast players. 
Hopefully this transition over the next uh, couple of months will not disrupt too much for you and you'll start seeing some of the new features. Now, when you do something like this, it's also a good uh, time to add some new content. And this is very much where Rich comes into the picture because in the background, Rich and I have for several months now been working on new content that we hope that you will really enjoy. Some of it will certainly be related to the updates on the trend industry that Rich used to do. We're now bringing that into the TTU world. We're expanding it. We're updating it. We are adding the top traders trend following model to the mix as well and so on and so forth. So that's going to be one of the kind of the reoccurring type of new, hopefully very uh, useful piece of content that you'll see. We have also been working really hard on coming up with a way for people, and I don't mean everyone, because of course, as you know, there's always going to be a certain investment level that you have to be able to meet in order to fully embrace trend following. But we have been working on finding a way to build a portfolio of CTAs that we, where the selection criteria is rules-based, but where we actually think that the outcome of this selection is better than anything we've seen before. And it actually would allow all investors to replace in full the 40% of a 60-40 portfolio, i.e. the bond part with this portfolio of CTAs. Now, I say CTAs, but it is really trend-following funds, which will overall produce a better return than a traditional 60-40 portfolio, which, by the way, hasn't done that badly. So it's not an easy task to do. But I think we found a way to do it that makes a lot of sense, inspired by some of the people in our industry. But I think we've taken it to the next level. And we can't wait to start sharing some of this, which we will once the website is ready and, and so on and so forth. So that's one part which is super exciting, I think. In addition to this, we hope to be able to publish some uh, new ebooks. So we want to upgrade that part of the uh, the website. And if if everything falls into place, we might even put some of all of this into a new book. It'll be, you know, not we're not going to compete with Alex and Katie in terms of their Bible on trend following, but we're going to give it a pretty good go and hopefully do it in a different way. Now, Okay, maybe some of this won't happen in the next three months, but we're certainly working towards all of this. So it is pretty exciting, I think, overall. And I'm also considering to be very transparent. I am considering ways of giving full access to my trend-following portfolio or model, which people have been able to listen, uh, hear about every week now for quite a while. Um, as I hope you can tell, it's uh, it's something that has been you know working for a long time. I think I've run it every single day now since 2007, so coming up to 15 years. So I feel it's part of my everyday life. But I will also be very transparent and say that if this is something that I decide to share, then it will not be a free res- free resource. This will be a paid uh, resource. I hope, but I also want to make sure that there is enough interest in that if I choose to do. So feel free to email me what your thoughts are, what your comments are on any of these points. Uh, I'd love to hear your feedback. I hope this can be the beginning of the next chapter of the podcast. We'll see it continue to expand, maybe so as well as new series on the actual podcast as well. But I think since we started in the trend-following world, I think the trend-following will always be at the very heart of what uh, we do and what I do personally. And so I want to find ways to, to take that even further because I think I speak for all of the people involved with the podcast. We really do feel that trend following should be a core part of any portfolio. And I've never seen a white paper written to say the opposite. So as long as that's the case, I think we we have a, a good claim on that. Is there anything I missed, Rich, in some of the stuff that we have been working on, you and I? Or No, you've, you've covered it well. It, it, it's it's a, going to be one of these fantastic transitions, Neil, that we talk I about. I hope so. Which, uh, 
will move us into the sort of the outlier and uh, where it just gets better and better. So I'm very much looking forward to it. I've been a, a long time listener of this this podcast, all of your series, and uh, it just continues to get better and better. So I'm exceptionally excited about what you're talking about here, and it's great to be a part of it. That's kind of you to say, and I certainly couldn't do much of the new stuff without you and Fred in, in the background as well. So we'll strive to hopefully surprise to the upside when we finally get around to all of this. But for now, at least, the way that you'll see this transition start is some new colors, some new graphics on the podcast episode, and so on and so forth. So that was really the update for now. As I said, if you wouldn't mind, help us with some rating and reviews because that really does allow us to grow the podcast even further. And this has been fantastic, which I really thoroughly enjoyed having you on today. And I can't wait until next time, which will be, of course, in a few weeks when you come back next week. Moritz is back. And as usual, that's going to be super fun and very educational, I'm sure. So send us your questions. You can email them to info at toptradersunplugged.com. Morris and I will do our best to answer all of them. And of course, you can follow all of us on Twitter. I think that's it for, uh, for today from Rich and me. Thanks so much for listening. And we look forward to being back with you next week. Until that time, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. If you enjoy this series, go on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating and review. And be sure to listen to all the other episodes from Top Traders Unplugged. If you have questions about systematic investing, send us an email with the word question in the subject line to info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll try to get it on the show. And remember, all the discussion that we have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their products before you make investment decisions. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Systematic Investor.